Some of the hardest problems in the world exist far above the planet. Our job, to launch the smartest solutions, to protect our satellites, clean up our clutter, to propel breakthroughs in propulsion, to learn more about our place in the universe, to outpace emerging threats. Every day, the Aerospace Corporation uses the latest technologies to ensure our nation's safety and leadership in space. Hi, and welcome to the Space Policy Show. Today, we're talking about the Space Force and how did we get here with Marty Whalen and Doug Lavero. As usual, please engage with us on Twitter using hashtag Space Policy Show or on Vimeo in the dialogue box below. I'd like to talk about Marty and give you a little bit of his bio. So Marty is a senior vice president of Defense Systems Group at the Aerospace Corporation. In this role, he's responsible for promoting the use of corporate and government resources through horizontal and cross-program integrated planning and engineering. Whalen retired from the Air Force in 2016 as a major general after 33 years of service, which I think is pretty impressive. And his first Air Force assignment was serving as an engineer on the space shuttle program where he went on to command at the squadron and wing levels and performed numerous missile warning, space control, and missile operations missions. That's definitely a mouthful, but quite impressive. Wayland's last assignment was as Director of Future Operations. It's the HQ U.S. Air Force in the Pentagon and Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations. I'd like to kick it over to you, Marty, to introduce our guest, Doug Lavero. Thanks. Thank you both for being here today. Hey, thank you, Rebecca. And uh, I'm happy to be uh, here with Doug Lavero. Uh, Doug's an uh, old friend and sparring partner and commiserator and uh, so forth. But, uh, but let me tell you a little bit about Doug and then we'll get into the conversation if that's okay. Uh, Doug's a graduate of the Air Force Academy uh, back in 1976, if I remember right. I am getting uh, old. A, a bachelor of Science in Chemistry. Uh, and then got a physics degree, for, uh, advanced degree from the University of New Mexico. He served in the Air Force about 30 years, retiring as a grade colonel. Um, he then went into the executive, senior executive service where he was executive director of the Space and Missile Systems Center in Los Angeles, and later the deputy assistant secretary of defense for space policy. Um, and I was able to work with Doug from his military career through his uh, time at the Space Missile System Center and into the, uh, the Pentagon. Doug's had a long history working space programs on the acquisition side, the policy side. Uh, he worked programs like GPS and the launch programs and space base infrared system and the future imagery architecture. And in the policy side works space control policy, international cooperation in space. Uh, the space reorganization that we're going to be talking about today. Um, but Doug is famously forgotten for the work that he did to bring the Department of Defense and the intelligence community together to start putting a budget together, to start building the budget for fiscal years 16 through 21 to build up the capabilities that our Department of Defense are building out today. Um, people know the money is coming, but it's for many people, it's magic. Uh, for me, I know it was a, a long summer of 2014 that I got to work with Doug and a group of talented people uh, to start building those budgets. So um, Doug is both my friend and, like I said, sparring partner <laughs> and a big thinker. I want to welcome you to the, to the discussion. Hey, uh, thanks, uh, thanks so much, Marty. It's uh, it's great to be back together again. And boy, uh, that's a that's a long introduction uh, for uh, uh, for me. I wish I could introduce you as well because your your background is just as as uh, startling and uh, fantastic uh, in the whole space world. We've been, as you've said, we were we've been working together for an awful long time, and it's and it's been really been fun because uh, you know we don't always agree, and that's okay. That's how we find uh, find truth and. Um, it's been excellent to work both on the same side as the Air Force and sometimes on different sides when uh, when you were in the Air Force and I was in uh, DOD. And what's interesting is together, um, we we and so many others have gotten us to this place where we are today, where we've got uh, now a Space Force, a U.S. Space Command, uh, a budget um, uh, for space that is uh, that is really set up to address the issues that 
we're going to face in the future. Um, and so I think it's, uh, you know, it's been a long, hard uh, amount of work by a lot of folks. Um, and I've, I've just been happy to be part of it, as I know you have. Uh, Marty, and we still continue to work on it every day. Even uh, it, it's not just uh, it's not just past stuff that we did. It's uh, stuff that we're doing every day today because it's so important uh, for the nation. So thank you for having me today. Well, well Doug, let's let's talk about uh, that emergent that's going on. And first, I want to talk about the need for a space force. Um, we, we can't talk a whole lot and because uh, a good amount of the, the emphasis is at the um, threat level. But, you know, are our space systems being threatened today? And is that an emphasis or an impetus to have a space force? Well, you know, um, Marty, as you, as you know, um, the the need for a space force has been um, has been talked about and has been around for a long time. And I think we might get into that. Um, a little bit uh, later, uh, but as and as you just talked about in 2014, the summer of 2014, um, it started to become clear that things in space were threatened. Uh, we saw actions uh, by other nations that told us that they were going to hold our space capabilities at risk, um, and because those cap those space capabilities really were not designed to go ahead and um, and act in that kind of environment to, to to function in that kind of environment, they were really designed to function in a more in a in a more peacetime environment, which was a relatively new development versus where we started space in the sixties and the seventies. But at least since the nineties, we had um, always assumed that space would be a, a sanctuary, um, and that was never um, a long term uh, strategy for us. It was just how we how we uh, came evolved, upon yeah. things. Yeah, exactly. And so by the time 2014 rolled around, we realized um, that we needed to do something. And, you know, and, and as you remember, Marty, I think it's interesting. That I, I think most people don't know the, the background. It started off as uh, a discussion about just what new things did we need? What new systems did we need? How did we need to redesign them? We wrote about resilience and we wrote about Space Mission Assurance, but there were s several of us um, in the building um, that believed, you know, yeah, it's about the things, but it's also about how we manage those things and how we plan for those things, how we strategize for those things. And and we saw that that was going to require perhaps a change in organization. And so so it's absolutely certain that the threat um, that the threat that we saw was the impetus uh, behind that. And, and once we got done with the budget, once we got done in building the 2016 to 2021 budget, as you mentioned uh, just a little bit early, earlier, then we began to chain, turn our, our attention to, okay, now we've got the money. How do we make sure the money gets used correctly? How do we make sure we're organized to use it correctly? So, so the threat caused us to recognize the problem. Um, in recognizing the problem, we recognized it was more than just things. It was it was people. It was training. It was doctrine. Um, and once you go ahead and recognize that, it, it um, naturally leads to a call for a, um, a new organi organizational look um, at how we should uh, do things. So, um, so as that started rolling, we had uh, a number of major events. You know, General Hyten, when he was the Air Force Space Command, had his uh, um, Space Enterprise Vision. Uh, he did a, a 60 Minutes interview that really brought some attention to the threats and the need to organize differently. And then in uh, December 20th of 2019, uh, out at Andrews Air Force Base, uh, they stood up the uh, U.S. Space Force. And uh, I saw all kinds of good memes about that and, you know, the discussion of, of you know, do we really need a space force? And is this just some kind of posturing? And uh, having known the background, I, I knew that there was some, some value there, but from a benefit, you know, if, if you're gonna talk to um, your mother, um, you know, up in New York or my mother back in Illinois, what would you tell them the benefit of the space force is? You know, that's a, a great question. I mean, as you know, um, as you know, Marty, we, uh, uh, we, we debated this a lot and, and part of the debate, um, came to the, um, came down to the, you know, is, is there really something different about space? Is space fundamentally different than other domains or not? And does that, those differences, 
dictate um, uh, dictate a, a need to change an organization. So uh, you talk about my mother uh, up in New York, although actually she's down in my basement right now. She's come to live with us uh, for <laughs> <laughs> for the for the summer. Um, but um, uh, you know, um, I actually did explain that uh, to her at one point uh, during this this whole debate. Why do we Why do we need it? Because people had heard it um, through TV comedy shows or through. Um, uh, or through uh, commentaries by, on the news or by the president or whomever. And folks were asking, why do we really need it? And, you know, the in my mind, I think when you try to explain it um, to, the, uh, to your mother or to the American public or to each other, um, I think we have to recognize uh, the, the following. Um, space um, has an outside dramatic impact on everything that we do in, in the U.S., both from a national security perspective um, to a uh, civil uh, and, and commercial perspective. It has a an incredibly huge um, impact, um, way le a, a impact that's leveraged by tens or hundreds fold over the investment that we make in space. It may be a small investment, but it's a, but the leverage that it provides is incredible. And for every one of us who uses GPS every day on our phone, um, we, we understand that leverage. Uh, but it's so much more than GPS. Um, it's just the easiest one for us as uh, civilians to understand. And that leverage is what gives us um, economic power. It gives us uh, military power. It gives us political and diplomatic power. It gives us, it gives us power um, uh, to support uh, U.S. Uh, objectives around the world. And so, we needed to make sure that we don't lose that power. Yeah, so that power, though, also... Um gives us a reliance and it as does. a country that, that becomes reliant on space doesn't that create uh, a vulnerability you know it, it, it does it absolutely does i remember sitting um, in an office with um that's for acquisition and technology and logistics uh, mr frank kendall back um, early in our discussions of all these things and i and i drew him a little picture i said look we have an imbalance here we are highly reliant on space things, and, and, and we can't fight wars today without space things, and yet space things are highly vulnerable. This is an imbalance that has to be corrected. Now, there are two ways to correct that imbalance. One way to correct that imbalance is to stop relying on space things so much, um, and, and therefore the imbalance goes away and you don't worry about it anymore. But if you do that, um, then all of that multiplicative power that we just talked about, that ability to go ahead and, and multiply the 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 effectiveness of your forces by a factor of, of 10, all that multiplicative power goes away, which means you need to build more bombs and you need to fly more planes, you need to sail more ships, and at the end of the day, um, lose more lives on both sides of, uh, of a conflict. Um, so you really don't want to give up that space, uh, that space power. So, so if you're reliant on it, you don't want to give it up, well, then the only other alternative is to make sure that it's protected and it can be secured and what we what we came to phrase as, as space mission assurance, assuring space was there. Uh, and so, and, and as we looked at that, and, and, uh, and I know that you remember those discussions and everybody in the Pentagon at the time uh, remember those discussions, it was not clear which side of that equation we wanted to sit on. Um, but once we decided we were gonna sit on the side of that balance sheet that said, we wanna continue that reliance because we find that reliance to be to our benefit, then we realized that reliance came with a uh, responsibility to figure out how we're going to go ahead and assure those space capabilities, whether that's to protect them, defend them, to make them more resilient or whatever it might be. Right. And that's uh, where they, we got into the big debate on, you know, the, the, the balancing of reliance and resilience and, exactly. and, and, and bring them into check. Um, so, so we started on that process, but, but there's some shortfalls now, um, you know, has, we, I'll call it things that we never got to, and that is how do you apply things like the military principles of warfare to space? Yeah. And uh, it's very well studied on the land and the sea. Um, it's been developed for air, uh, but uh, I believe that there's some work to be done on military principles and how they're applied to warfare. Um, have you had discussions with people down that path? So, so I have, you know, um, uh, you and I were talking the other day, uh, Marty, I happen to be, um, I, I happen to go back to the Eisenhower School um, every year to sit down with the classes there and, and review their space studies program. And we were talking about um, this very question. And the question you ask really is a question about doctrine. 
is is what is the correct doctrine uh, for space? Um, how does how do how do those traditional elements of, of of mass and unity of command and maneuver how do those apply in space? And a lot of folks, it's interesting. A lot of folks believed the doctrine for a, for space should look like the doctrine for air. And in fact, um, many of the presentations the students that were given um, were were all about that. And I said, well. Um, did you really think that that is necessarily the right doctrine? Is, is our air operations, are they the same as space operations? And for example, in the air, we talk about air superiority as one of the hallmarks of, um, of uh, the doctrine for um, air power um, in the military. Um, and yet, if you go to the undersea Navy, you've never heard the undersea Navy talk about undersea space superiority. Um, that's not that's not their doctrine. Um, they don't go and try to control the undersea um, area of the of the world. They try to go ahead, in fact, sneak around in it um, and get work done. And that's far too much of a simplification uh, for what the the undersea navy um, does. But it's a different it's a different doctrine than the surface the navy, surface. which is than the surface navy. Um, and so one of the great things I think about having um, a space force and one of the things that I think is still left undone, as you said, is to go figure out that doctrine. And, you know, the way we figure out doctrine over time uh, for militaries is is interesting. Um, it's mostly through trial and error. Um, mm -hmm. We figure out we figure out doctrine through trial and error uh, and um, and doctrine changes over time. The doctrine is linked to equipment. Um, so the kind of equipment, the doctrine for for how you do land battles, if you are if you don't have tanks and you're in trench warfare, is a different doctrine uh, when you have uh, tanks on the battlefield and you can maneuver at will, and um, and a, and an offense becomes a far more powerful capability. So, so we have to go ahead and do more experiments. And, and the bad part is we don't want to have to have five space wars before we figure out what doctrine is, which means we have to do a lot. A lot of wargaming and a lot of uh, study, and I think that's the most immature thing that I see right now um, in space is uh, is the is the amount, of, not just the amount of wargaming we do, but the variety and and practicing with different doctrines, trying different ideas out, trying to go ahead and experiment. The Navy so the, was great at, at that. Go ahead. I was going to say so at the peril of extrapolating from air because i do agree with you or you know there, there's some shortfalls to that there is some value so the need for a a, a robust space test range and mm -hmm. when i say test range it's really it's really an operational range to develop tactics techniques and procedures so that we can understand cause and effect and develop those tactics techniques and procedures that may be necessary i think that's one of the 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 near term got to go do's that we didn't really um, successfully lay in a, a budget and a, and a, a program for. It. Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. Uh, you, you, you may even remember some of the discussions we had about that. And, and those discussions happened both in the Air Force and within the in the DOD at the, at the time. Um, but you're 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 absolutely right. I mean, it's this is this is the way that you hone doctrine you have to play with, um, and um, and that takes exactly that kind of wargaming, and that takes a test a space test range. It takes a space test a space school. Um, it takes all the kinds of things. I do love the fact that the new um, the new uh, space force is going to have a star command. Um, it does sound like something from a Buzz Lightyear um, uh, <laughs> carton, um, but it is so important. Um, it is the the space uh, space training. That's where it will be done, and that's where that's where those games need to need to get played. Um, and and I'm sure, I suspect. I don't know. I mean, have you been have you been asked about that at all, uh, Marty? Is that something that that you've been involved in? Is trying to figure out how to do any of that space war game? Well, I do know that there's a there's a strong effort underway to uh, uh, develop a more robust um, uh, training environment to include range uh, training, and and that uh, uh, our company Aerospace is helping uh, some folks that are out there really working on that. Um, but but one of the other um, perils that we find in it is you know there is a difference between a a uh, test range and a training range and um, 
space doesn't know the difference. It's just space. So it's how we define it. And so we've got to define it in such a way that it can perform a function, a necessary function for the acquisition community, which is test, and a necessary mm -hmm. function for the operational community, which is developing those tactics, techniques, and procedures, and find a way to, an efficient way to be able to do it for both. And I think there's a way forward there. You know, Marty, it might be useful. Um, uh, you were you were assigned um, uh, to um, so some of the Air Force, um, uh, you know, training and test organizations. It might be useful to talk about how we, how do we do that in the Air Force, and how does that how does that then um, come over to the space side of things? Yeah, um, as you know, one of my assignments was at Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, I was commanding a space unit there, and. Uh, just got to be able to be part of the environment there. And there is an informal cross flow of information between the operational community, the test community and industry, the contractors. Um, it usually involved a Friday night at the officer's club and people telling stories and communicating. And so you'd have um, the acquirers, the operators, and the contractors, your industry partners, talking about maybe a test that happened that week and a shortfall, and is there a way to fix this problem? Or, you know, while we were getting ready for this, I had this idea, can we exploit this and go forward? And, and um, the way we're organized in space, historically, under the Air Force, we didn't have as great communications. There was always this um, contractual barrier between the military and the industrial base. You know, uh, you had to plan ahead. You had to give me read ahead. You had to tell me what you're going to tell me before you could tell me. And we didn't have that informal communication. And I think that needs to be captured through whether it's, you know, Friday at an officer's club or a brown bag series or just more open dialogue between industry and military. And then within the military, we do have those communities, the acquisition community, whose job it is to build and field things, and the operational community, whose job it is to operate things. And in that transition, a lot of intelligent work is lost because the operators don't get involved heavily early in the acquisition. So a lot of the learning and development doesn't transport to the operator and the acquirers who have all that knowledge when they feel that they move to the next mission and so we don't fully exploit the capabilities that we actually developed and so we have to find a way to bring those communities closer together and i think u.s space force has an opportunity to organize differently and to bring those communities into one or at least closer to one um, to, to bring that knowledge across that scene yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. You know, it was interesting when you saw the actual um, uh, direction come down from the Secretary of Defense on standing up the Space Force. One of the things it said specifically in the in the um, uh, action memo, which and I and I won't quote it directly because I don't have it in front of me, uh, but it basically said, "Don't assume that you have to be organized like any of the other services. Come out with the organization that's right for space." And and I've had several conversations with. Uh, folks uh, since that time. I think I mentioned uh, uh, to you, I had a conversation with uh, John Shaw, who's uh, the, currently the head of the 14th Air Force um, right now, about how do we how do we label people in this new Space Force? In, in traditional military services, we label people with specific codes. They're called specialty codes, and we label them as either a rifleman or a pilot or an acquisition guy. And I said, do we really need those labels in space? I, I gave a speech one time at the National Space Symposium, and I talked about the fact that almost all space acquirers um, early in their careers were, space, were operators. Um, in many cases, um, they, were, uh, they were actually air operators um, because we didn't have space back in the, in the 50s. And so we had all these operational folks who became space acquirers and then would go back and forth and become space operators and space acquirers. In my own history, for example, being a space acquirer and a space policy person, um, made actually made me made me more valuable at policy because I had under because I understood the space systems better because I had built them and designed them and acquired them. And I and I and I I think that thing that same dynamic um, works between um, space operations, space 
tactics, space um, policy, space acquisition, space intelligence, all of those skills, the common thing is space. And when you only have a, when you only have a, a core of 6,000 to 8,000 individuals, um, doesn't it make more sense to have them being skilled across the entire gamut of um, space specialties? Yeah, they're going to spend most of their time doing one thing or the other, but do we really want to pigeonhole them by assigning them a number? Or do we want to go ahead and look at their skills and their own academic background and say, you know, this person could go ahead and um, and design a system today and go fly and fight that system tomorrow. That's the way the National Reconnaissance Office does it, um, and they happen to uh, do it quite well. Um, and I think it is something, again, we need to not, trans, not transplant directly from Air Force to the Space Force. We need to think about that. How do we want to, um, how do we want to manage our people and grow our people so they can truly think strategically about space um, for the nation? Um, and it's probably right. a multifaceted background. And I, I think people people do have an affinity for one, you know, for one part of that spectrum or another. But people do cover the full spectrum. Um, yep. You know, I, I I look at you and you know. Here you are as a technical person who did acquisition, and you were in charge of space policy. At the same time, you had a uh, a mate in OSD who was a poli sci major, um, Gil Klinger, who was in charge of acquisition. So um, while people have certain training, people also have capabilities to to bring that skill set to a different job, and it makes you look at things a little bit differently, broader, um, and, and kind of brings the whole um, uh, liberal arts approach, if you will, to the to the entire spectrum. It makes us a better a better nation for it. Yeah, I, I think it does too. And, and of course, I always like to point out that our both you and my good friend, John Hyten, um, began as an acquisition officer and is now the the second highest ranking operator in the in the DOD. Um, and so um, it just uh, go that uh, that that transition is actually fairly seamless. And some of our best folks, Don Katina, um, who was the uh, one of the former commanders of U.S. Space Command, uh, was a operator at the beginning of his career and an acquirer in the entire middle of his career up until he was a senior colonel and then a, and then an operator again uh, later in his career. And I think that that kind of that kind of um, uh, movement is actually really good for service like the like the space force and it's by the way we talked about the navy a little bit earlier it's not that different than the nuclear navy and the nuclear navy um the the guys who are designing the nuclear submarines are also the guys who are operating the nuclear submarines um because um uh, because they that's the folks that understand um how that weapon will be used in the fight and how it needs to be uh, designed to be safe and it's a, a critically important part of their of their whole culture that they that they flow seamlessly um, between the two sides of those things. Yeah, I think it's a it's bringing that development, deployment to the field, and then employment into the fight. Yep. And the, the, if you can bring the full body of knowledge through that, you're you're a more capable operator, sustainer, and developer of the next system. I mean, it, yep. it is a it is a complete cycle. Uh, the shortfalls of one system inform the requirements and needs for the next system. That's right. That's right. You know, one of the reasons that we have traditionally not done that in the services is because we want people to specialize quickly so they can go through the different levels of command, right? Squadron and 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 group and, and wing or whatever we're going to call them in, in the Space Force. I don't think we're going to call them wings. They would, we don't have wings um, on satellites. Um, but um, but that's an artif that too is an artificial constraint about how we um, how we decide to um, to promote people and how we decide to to bring them through their career, and so we again need to look at a different kind of a, a flow uh, for um, for our space forces. And I think that's I think this this question this this question about how we do that is is going to be uh, really one of the keys uh, for the space force as it organizes itself. Um, and I don't think it's a question we've really begun to attack yet, although I do know the conversations are, are going on. So, so Doug, we've been talking, you know, th th this whole spectrum, but I want to focus on one end of it, and that's the acquisition piece. Um, I think uh, 
um, decision making. Uh, Congressman Rogers referred to decision making the Pentagon as the kudzu of space decision making because of so many organizations involved. And um, since the uh, discussion of stand up and the stand up of Space Force, we actually have more acquisition organizations than we used to. So as you go forward with the US Space Force, and underneath them, uh, they'll have a Space Systems Command, but there's also a Space Rapid Capabilities Office. There's still an Air Force Rapid Capabilities Office that does space, an Army Rapid Capabilities Office, or Army in Army Futures that does space, and the Space Development Agency. Is, is, is that a fractured approach, or is that, is that good stimulus? Well, you know, so I think number one, it's um, this is a temporary condition that we're seeing right now. This is it's fractured right now because it, of where it started, not necessarily because it where it's going to. Um, that said, I do believe that you have to have um, different organizations with different cultures looking at the same at the same problem and coming up with protect possibly different uh, different solutions. Uh, now, I will tell you, um, and, and you and I have spoken about this many times and Marty um, I think sometimes we don't understand what the acquisition problems are we sometimes think the acquisition problems are the rule set that controls how we do acquisition I don't actually having done acquisition all my career I don't believe that I think it's actually the tr the expertise of the folks who are within the acquisition um, system uh, that um, that really dictates um, the outcomes and and if anything we have been uh, we have been short on uh, assuring that we have the right ex expertise in the acquisition system. But the number of organizations you talked about, you know, it, I think there is going to be a Space Systems Command, which I think is great. And of course, for those of us who entered the Air Force in Air Force Systems Command, um, it, uh, it uh, reminds us um, that perhaps we start, perhaps where we started um, had it right in the first place. Uh, I also found out recently, by the way, from, uh, from uh, John Shaw, that it looks like some of the organizations that had originally left Air Force Space Systems Command when we stood up Space Command may end up back in Space Systems Command. I don't want to give away the surprise um, at, uh, at this uh, stage, but, <laughs> uh, but um, that's good. It, it, it actually shows a maturity in understanding what part of space is really acquiring and what part of space is really operating. Um, and because sometimes just because something has flames coming out of the back end and a and little winglets on the on the end of it, it sure looks like operations. But in reality, that's just a delivery truck uh, getting the getting the operations. Um, uh, and to a go very forward. short part of the life cycle of the exactly exactly important, right exactly important right important part <laughs> important part that's exactly right. So 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 I think all of the I think the number of organizations are gonna are gonna settle themselves out. Now I'll, I'll tell you, I think we should always maintain. Organiza uh, acquisition organizations that are different than one another with different cultures that will take different approaches. But I think they obviously need to be under a, uh, a single level of management. And, and in fact, again, if I, if I can use the NRO as an example, you know, the NRO when they began had three or four different organizations under it and all of them had very, very different cultures. There was an Air Force culture, there was a Navy culture, um, there was a, uh, a, a intelligence community culture. Um, amongst uh, amongst those organizations, and they all approach the same problem: How do we make sure the nation stays ahead in um, overhead reconnaissance? They approach the problem differently, and they came out with different answers. Uh, and those answers were then brought to a central place, uh, which at the time was the director of the NRO, to say, "Which of these answers do you like the best? Who's going to go ahead and get the most of the money to do it?" Sometimes, sometimes two things got funded. Sometimes three things got funded. Mm -hmm. um, that's oh, that's okay. We in space have been have been um, have been uh, held to a standard that you can only have one kind of every system uh, that we have. If we held the uh, the DoD to that standard for aircraft, we'd only have one kind of aircraft for all of DoD. Um, if it was a fighter aircraft or a bomber aircraft or a cargo aircraft, we'd only have one of each of those kinds. But instead, um, we have a an incredible penelope of um, different fighter aircraft, different electronic support aircraft, different um, bomber aircraft, uh, different cargo aircraft. We have all sorts of them because different services have different needs, different doctrine requires uh, requires different capabilities. So should there only be one kind of position navigation and timing system? Should there only be 
one kind of missile warning system. If you have different organizations, you might see different answers. And it would, and it's interesting as those different answers um, uh, mature and evolve, um, they end up creating new opportunities that can then be yeah. used to further force. So I think it's great to have competition in the acquisition. Yeah, it kind of goes community. back to what we talked about earlier, which was the, you know, the reliance, uh, a word I'll introduce now is the fragility, because I think we bought space systems efficient, efficiently, uh, right. as efficiently as you could. Um, but war fighting is done effectively. Coming in second place is not a good place to come in in a, in a battle. That's right. Having having the most efficient and cheapest system that loses the loses the war is not exactly the best thing. Um, I think I think you and I had that argument with folks from certain um, organizations within uh, DoD um, when when you and I were both in the in the building at, yeah. a, at a time uh, about because it's the cheapest way to do it doesn't mean it's the right military way to do it. So um, hey, uh, we're, our time's running a little short here, so. Um, you know, there's 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 a lot of people that are tuning into the show from the acquisition community, the engineering world, the operations world. Um, we've seen a lot of activity here, but but you know, if 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 you were advising the leadership of the DoD and the U.S. Space Force, what two or three things do they have to get after in the near term to make sure that we don't go backwards? Uh, in the development of a space force. Wow, that's a that's a loaded question. Um, let me. Uh, the I ones know that I limited come... you to two or three. And you probably have about a hundred on a list. Yeah, right in front of you. yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. So um, you know, some of it I've spoken about already. I mean, number one is is don't sh don't shortchange the development of doctrine. So right now there seems to be developing a strategy for how we're going to fight a space war. And yet we have not spent the time necessary to really play with that enough. Um, I, I know, for example, the new Space Force is going directly in the training for space, um, for space combat, if I can use that term, which is a term that I don't really like, but it's the only one that comes to mind right now. Um, but you can't train with it. Unless you have, if you, unless you've really gone ahead and test, and we're not very good in space about testing alternative doctrines. And so number one, I, I have to always come back to go go let folks at whatever star at star command the the space uh, the space academic um, uh, you know university let them play with different doctrines and let them try different things and encourage them to do different things and really understand what works and what doesn't, um, uh, both with the kind of systems that we have today and the kind of systems we might be contemplating um, in the future. Number two, and I have to hand it to uh, General Willie Shelton, who did this, um, who did this fantastically for the space operations career field in the Air Force. Um, he understood the academic background that was necessary to become a good space operator. Go look very carefully at what kind of academic background you want for your space personnel and how you want to train, how you want them to be trained, how you want them, how you want them to go ahead and be developed. Um, go look at the fundamentals and their entire career path, and don't just go ahead and cut and paste um, the way we do it um, in the Air Force. It may be, it may be very, very uh, different. Um, that is so, it is so critical to make sure that you get all the fundamental basics done and you grow people um, so they become true sh space strategists. Um, over time, and and I think we sometimes undercut that. We we look at assignments as assignments rather than as training opportunities. And so I think we need to really spend some time understanding how do you train somebody so that by the time he's a colonel or a general, he is truly a space strategist and can really go ahead and think about how the nation um, wins wars or deters wars and wins wars if deterrence fails um, in space. And then the last thing I would do is um, don't don't think that the Space Force's job is limited to solely what happens within the DoD, uh, because there's a whole ecosystem of space um, going on out there um, internationally, commercially, uh, from a policy perspective. Um, the Space Force needs to grow up and decide to have the big voice in that they're the ones who understand who are going to understand this domain the best. They're the ones. Um, who need to go ahead and um, and make their needs known 
uh, to the uh, national decision makers about these are the kind of policies we need. These are the kinds of th ways we want to do space traffic management. These are the kind of rules of the road that we need in space. We've been, we've been hesitant as a DOD to go ahead and jump into that. Um, in fact, uh, part of the reason we haven't really gone beyond the 1967 Outer Space Treaty is because the DOD has been reticent to say, here are the right rules for space. Well, you can't understand those rules unless you understand the doctrine. Once you understand the doctrine, then the Space Force needs to promulgate what are the rules for operations in space so that the so that we can actually go ahead and uh, create the same kind of rules we have on the sea or on land about how we do both peace operations and military operations um, in those domains. And I think it's uh, it's our re our responsibility as as space um, strategists and space warfighters to start to go ahead and promulgate those new rule sets uh, for the U.S. because that's that's key to actually keeping the peace in space over the long term. So, so, so if I were mission things. control, if I was mission control and talking to you um, uh, and doing a read back, I would say that what you what you just told me is we have to study doctrine so that we can uh, understand it and build things differently. We have to understand the academic bona fides that we need so we can grow people differently and grow strategists that can think about this. And then we have to look at the ecosystem so that we can approach problems differently and bring in um, academia, bring in NASA, the State Department, and the industrial base, our contractors, and make them truly part of the team, not just an appendage with a barrier. Um, is, is that a fair readback? Yeah. Uh, you 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 said um, in two minutes what I said very poorly in ten minutes. So thank you. That's excellent. <laughs> yeah, no, that's 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 perfect. I mean, that, I, I think those are those are those fundamental things get overlooked as we talk about uh, uniforms and seals. But not that those are important, by the way. I happen to be a big believer in having a, in having um, uh, these uh, these physical things that identify who we are. So I, I'm not I'm not demeaning that um, at all. But but let's not overlook these fundamentals. And we don't have we don't have a thousand years of um, land warfare to develop them. Uh, we don't have hundred we don't have a thousand years of naval of naval uh, warfare to develop those. So so this means that we have to really concentrate on getting this done so that we're ready for the first uh, space war when it inevitably happens sometimes in the future. Well, thanks, Doug. I really appreciate your thought and uh, insight. And uh, you know, as normal, I agree with about. 80 to 90 percent of what you said <laughs> but but as i'm on my own journey too to, to try to understand exactly how to do this better but i think the unifying thing is we both support and defend the constitution we both understand the importance of the mission that the u.s space force is doing and we both look for ways to improve it and uh, i appreciate your partnership as we as we continue to struggle to do this better yeah, no, Marty. Uh, again, it's it's always a pleasure to talk to you and to and to discuss these things. I mean, this is how we really find out what's uh, what's really right and what's really wrong. You have to argue a little bit in order to go ahead and figure out what uh, what where truth is. Um, and as you say, I mean, we we uh, you and I and and many others are um, have uh, have supported um, this this journey that we're on for for so for so long, and it's so critical to get it right. And uh, you know, I'm going to continue to help. In any way I can, as uh, as we move forward, uh, just as you are, and we all do it from our from our own little knot hole um, of the world. Uh, but this is uh, this is too important for the nation for us not to spend the time and energy to get it right. So, thank you for uh, for being part of this today, and thanks to Aerospace for sponsoring um, this uh, this great discussion. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Doug, for for your service to the nation, your service to space, and for making it fun. <laughs> thank you. So, all right, with that, we'll, uh, we'll say goodbye. It's uh, great to talk to you today. Thank you both so much, Marty and Doug, for being on the show today. We had an awesome conversation talking about the Space Force and how did we get here. Please engage with us. We are on Twitter, hashtag the Space Policy Show. You can also engage on Vimeo, put your comments, questions in the dialog box below the video. And please sign up for our news alerts. We are at aerospace.org slash policy. It's very easy. Just click the stay up to date on the latest news section. Put your email in. I promise we won't sell it. Until next time, take care. <laughs>